Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you much. For, thank you very much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. Now, this morning, we are going to be looking at the whole concept of democracy as it's being used, as it's being touted in the United States of America. Now, everybody in the world touts the United States as the exemplar, right, of democracy. People look toward the United States, for example, as far as democracy and free institutions are concerned. And that is because they have one of, if not the best constitution that has ever been written by men. The United States of America has the best constitution, political constitution that has ever been written by men. And I do think that that constitution was God inspired, even though the men, that's the founding fathers, were not necessarily religious, but they understood the importance of the Protestant faith and what that faith had acquired for Western, the societies in Western Europe and in the Western world by extension. We cannot deny what the whole concept, the principles outlined in the Bible, you know, have done to give Western societies a firm grasp at what we call equality. Now, all societies will never be equal because human beings do not have that within their, their, their DNA to want to aspire to such an equal society. Even though we say that we do want to, but it's just mere retrograde. Right? It's not about sharing your wealth with others. Most people don't like to share even their dinner <laughs> with others, right? <laughs> much say, let's, you know, um, much less sharing your wealth with others. If you've had billions of dollars, if you have been able to garner that over the years, you're not going to willingly give up on that money to share with the poor. It's just not going to happen. And many of us think that it is because we learn from the textbooks that we are moving toward that diversity, equity, and inclusion philosophy or paradise, if you will. But we are not headed there. And it would be nice if the intentions were good. But I do not think that the intentions are necessarily good based on our selfish, narcissistic human qualities. And I hear a lot of people talking about Trump, and I've said it on this channel before, that Trump is not the only narcissist. The large, a large percentage of humanity is or are narcissistic or show narcissistic um, tendencies and qualities and characteristics. And that is why Lord Action says that power corrupts absolutely or absolute power corrupts absolutely. The United States of America is operating on absolute power. It is the indispensable power of the world. So dare you, any of you, I dare challenge you, even including myself, if we should stand at the helm of that power called the United States of America, we would also be narcissistic, right? Because you, when you're told to go, go and bomb a country, you bomb it. No questions asked and no challenges posed. That is the whole essence of what narcissism is all about. It's about you and not about any other person. So let's not, let's move away now from Trump is narcissistic. And when I talk to people, that is the first word that comes to their brain because they have been brainwashed. You hear it constantly in the media. So it's, it, it, it's, it's attached, it's affixed to your frontal lobe, the frontal lobe of your brain. And you cannot remove it because you have already been brainwashed by the media. But if you should think for yourself, you understand that the entire political system and the people atop of that political, military, and economic system in the US are for the most part narcissistic. 
Look at Hillary Clinton, for example. She's constantly in the media making pronouncements, pronouncements upon pronouncements when she was rejected by the populace in 2016. She wanted to be present herself and she tried without success and she's still speaking. If I were her, I would not speak because I realized that the people did not want me to be there. She's not, she's just not a candidate that they wanted to be president of the United States. I don't know whether that was a fair assessment or that was a fair um, action by the United States citizens, even though we should say that the United States citizens of the population did vote for her. She got the majority of the popular votes, only that she, she lost by the Electoral College. But be that as it may, I think she understands that she is still not popular in the U.S., among U.S. citizens. Now, yesterday, the political carried an article, and they entitled that article, The Republican Fantasy That the Democrats Will Replace Joe Biden. Now, there is a report by the special counsel um, on Biden about the fact that his mental faculties have deteriorated since he's become the president of the United States, and it doesn't seem like it's getting better. Now, Biden still is insisting that that report was unfair to him, even though Biden knows, I'm sure he knows that he does not have the mental acuity to remain in that job. But he still decides that he wants to remain. He wants a second term. Now, the Democratic Party likes to talk about democracy and that it needs to be maintained and we all need to fight for the preservation of democracy. But what does the Democratic Party mean when they say democracy? You have to look and you have to examine that word in light of what they are saying, in light of the context in which that word is being used. Is it the democracy that you and I know? Or is it another democracy? We've got to be able to look more deeply and to delve deeply into these matters, which many of us are not, because we rely on the mainstream media to feed us with our news. Because we would rather not think about the hard and complex questions. Now, listen to what the political is saying here, and they seem to be touting that it could Possibly, there could be, uh, you know, challenge to Joe Biden's presidency by Michelle Obama. The article here is purporting, but seems to disagree that Michelle might not be the best person for this job. Now, the opinion piece says the Republican fantasy that Democrats will replace Joe Biden. No, Michelle Obama is not going to be the nominee. So already they know. Even though 76% six, of Americans or 78% of Americans are unhappy with both presidential candidates, with both presidential nominees, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, 76 to 78%, depending on the poll you read, are unhappy. They are deeply uncomfortable with two men who are, what? well, one is already in his 80s and the other is approaching 80. He's going to be 78 shortly. And this is something that should be of major concern, that the United States of America is foisting two elderly men, senior citizens, who should be heading home right now to be president of the most powerful country in the world. And that Biden is not showing that he is mentally competent to, to be president, to continue in that office. 
But that is not the discussion. The discussion in the media, you know, is centered around Trump, Trump and the drama that surrounds him. And by the way, I want you to know that these are narratives that they are dispensing to you. These are not the truths. These are not the facts. They're just narratives and they're selling them to you because that's what it's all about, to market these people. So even if you should go and be president tomorrow, they'll have to market you. Not about who you are, but what they want to market you to be or as being. It's never, never the truth. And somebody was always asking me, why didn't Kamala Harris invite her father to the to the presidents, to the uh, the political inauguration when she was being invested as the vice president. All of these people are false and they have to be marketed to you. And that marketing is just as the narrative that they want the world to know about you, right? It's not about displaying that this is real because it's not real when you look at the full picture. Now, in a 20, 2024 presidential race with many imponderables, all we can know for sure is that Joe Biden won't be the Democratic nominee. That's interesting. That at least is what many Republicans actually believe or state publicly from the very top of the party to the people in the very last row of the latest Trump rally. But why should you make this now a Trump, a Republican issue? It should be that the country should decide or the Democratic Party should decide by having an election. Now, if you remember, the Democratic Party suppressed people from running for that party, including um, Robert F. Kennedy. He was not allowed, and also Cornel West. They were not allowed to challenge Joe Biden's leadership. Now, what form of democracy is that? When you have a man, even let us say that his mental faculties were in order, he should allow those men to challenge him because the people will decide eventually who they want to govern them. But we, you must understand now, if you have not yet understood that you do not run the show and you do not select these men, these men are selected by political forces of which you and I are not aware. And you've got to take stock. You've got to understand these things. You've got to open up your mind to assess these things and not think that you are in charge of your own destiny. Because it's not so. And this has been happening for decades. It's not just that it's happening between Biden and, and, uh, and Trump. They are just political actors, and it has reached a crescendo now that the clothes is of the emperor, and you can see his naked body. And that is what you are seeing right now. And many of us are not pleased by looking at America in its nude form. It is disgusting what we're seeing. Donald Trump has said he doesn't think Biden makes it. And when Ron DeSantis was still in the race, the Florida governor speculated Democrats may sub him out for someone else. So that is something that is very interesting. So the whole matter is that they're wondering, are they going to have at the, the, uh, the Democratic convention a situation in which they are going to replace Joe Biden with another candidate, such as Michelle Obama? So let us see what this opinion piece is suggesting here. There are two versions of this notion. One has Biden suffering some health event that forces him off the ballot. This isn't implausible. It could happen to anyone, but is obviously more likely with an 81-year-old who is visibly in decline than a robust 21-year-old, since there's no predicting such an eventuality. So they're suggesting that it's not probably going to happen. The other version has had Democrats plan to get Biden off the ballot all along and simply biding their time until they pull the trigger. This has never made any sense, but Biden's latest flubs 
mixing up the names of current European leaders with those from the 1980s and a special counsel report that is damning about his mental state are going to fuel more speculation. So now they're making a war between the Republicans and the Democrats. And it should not be a war, right? Because it is obvious that, that Joe Biden's mental faculties are in decline and that he is not fit to be president of any country. He's not fit to work anywhere, as a matter of fact. Whether he's a professor, a teacher, working at McDonald's, he's just not fit to work anywhere at this given moment. Not because of his problem. Well, it is his problem, but that we know that it is something that is natural, something that he perhaps has no control over. But he has to do the right thing. If he's saying, and if the media houses are saying, the American media houses are saying that Trump is narcissistic and that he's a threat. He is an existential threat to national security. So is Joe Biden. Because let us see that the president receives press briefings on a very delicate security matter. And he divulges the secrets to the world because his brain is not functioning. Then that is can be, can result in a serious or existential threat to the United States as a nation and its sovereignty. Again, he perhaps will not say these things intentionally, but he has no control over the illness that is afflict afflicting him. He doesn't have any control over that illness, as far as we know. Now, for Biden not to run requires Biden deciding on his own not to run. And that is what he should do. If that was going to be the call, he needed to make it last year to give the alternatives the chance to mount primary campaigns. Well, his election was already challenged from last year. And this hypocritical media in the United States, including the political, and I'm calling you all political, if you were there looking at and presenting this information to American citizens that yes, that there were contenders such as Robert F. Kennedy and Cornel West to the Joe Biden's presidency, but they were not allowed to do so. In fact, I presented to you last week news in which the Democratic Party is also seeking to suppress any independent candidate from running. So not only the, the uh, contenders in the Democratic Party, but contenders, including independent candidates, cannot and will not be allowed to challenge Joe Biden's leadership. Now, that to me is an interesting occurrence. And many of you are not really thinking deeply about the consequences of making such decisions. Because the purpose of democracy, as Abraham Lincoln has so succinctly stated, that it is a government of and for and by the people. It belongs to them, it is for them, and they are the ones who should run the show. But obviously, they're not running the show, even though they think, you know. And it's almost very interesting that people mindlessly go to vote year after year, believing that they are running the show. And I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't vote and you should not exercise your franchise. You should. But you must understand that if you do not pay attention to what is happening, then you will not be able to make an informed decision. And sometimes I wonder, not only for Americans, but for the citizens of the world in which we have these democratic societies. I do wonder if the whole system can be reformed. I do not think at this juncture of the history that it can be reformed. I think they wanted to reform slavery and, you know, and that institution. That is, that's what the, 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 the Republicans at the time under Abraham Lincoln wanted to do, right? Because Abraham Lincoln, as I told you, was not anti-slavery. 
he was just anti the expansion of slavery on American territory. But he wanted, he guaranteed the Southerners, not he wanted to, but he guaranteed the Southerners who wanted to, to, to secede from the Union that he would not upend the Southern system of slavery. He just did not want these slave masters to expand. But the point I'm making here is that the system, the entire system was rotten to the core, could not have been reformed and had to be completely upended. And I'm wondering at this juncture of American history, if the system is not so rotten that maybe it will also have to be upended. But I think this is going to be the last upending of democracy, right? Because at least slavery, you know, lasted for how many years in, in the U.S.? Over 100 years, perhaps? If not, none, less than 100 years, right? Because it, let us say that, it, well, it lasted more. Yeah, it lasted more. But we're talking about the brutal one, right? Even though we had slavery from the inception of the country. But that slavery was, let's suggest, milder than what happened after the 1820s. But that system had to go, had to be completely uprooted. Because democracy and slavery could not function on the same soil. Now, slavery has just been supplanted for militarism. I told you about that. Or an empire, imperialism, I should say militarism and imperialism, which are actually Siamese twins. I did a video on that. You should go and listen to that video. Now, it's worth remembering, by the way, that the last person on the planet who is going to come to the conclusion that Joe Biden isn't capable of being president any longer is Joe Biden. Now, I think I read this already. Um, so, and he should make that decision. Now the question is being asked here: Who would be the alter? Who would the alternative be? Kamala Harris has lower ratings than Joe Biden. <laughs> you know that's interesting that she has lower ratings than Joe Biden. Gavin Newsom, he looks good or on paper and on TV, but is completely untested at the national level. In his primary campaign in 2020, Pete Buttigieg demonstrated little appeal outside his upper middle class white progressive base. Same with Elizabeth Warren. Bernie Sanders is an 82-year-old avowed socialist and so on. Socialist, really? As for Michelle Obama, she is highly popular among Democrats, a major cultural figure and a talented communicator. So she's giving her her props. Outside the question of whether she'd want to do it, no, no, and no, she has never run for anything, and it's quite possible that she's not actually a skilled political candidate. Because whether we like it or not, she has to be saleable. She has to be saleable. It's not just about political talent, which I'm sure she has, but she has to be saleable, marketable. And I'm not sure that the United States is ready to market a black woman to be the president of the United States. Barack got away with it because he was mixed, according to U.S. standards. He was um, in, uh, he was mixed race uh, candidate, and I've always said that Obama is phenotypically black, according to American standards again, but culturally he's more white than black. And that is what Americans have to understand. Now, this person is suggesting that, you know, Michelle Obama is a no-no. I'm not sure where this opinion piece or the, the, the writer of this opinion piece is getting her information from. 
even if the party's power brokers considered one of these figures far and away superior to others, would the other candidates agree? Would Kamala Harris say consent to getting bypassed by Gavin Newsom? Why would she? And if not, Democrats would be looking for a nasty political brawl at an open convention. And that might happen, you know, who to tell. But I don't think there'll be any brawl. I just think the powers that be, the political forces behind the, the political system, is going to determine, or are going to determine, uh, who the candidate should be. Now, look at what she's suggesting here about Biden. First, Biden does not look and sound so enfeebled. It's hard to believe that political party would really be uh, pinning all its hopes, including purportedly saving American democracy on him. Of course, that's a solid point. And we don't have to say this is a Republican talking point because it is obvious. It is obvious that Biden isn't doing very well and that the Democrats, not only the Republicans, should see that. But again, this is partisan politics that is being played here and nothing else. Very empty, very vacuous, and lacks any amount of substantive um, analysis. In the latest NBC News poll, 76% of voters, right? And I think I had told you that before. I intimated that at the beginning of my video. 76% of voters have concerns about whether Biden has the requisite mental and physical health to be president for a second term, a threshold question of fitness that wasn't there in 2012. Right? So 76%. Now, one would have thought that that is the majority. And that the president would listen, because as far as I am concerned, and as we have been so told in the media, his presidency, that's Joe Biden's presidency, was the major thrust was to save democracy. Because democracy was on the on, on, on a fast free fall. Because of Trump's existential threat to democracy. So they had to have chosen Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. This is interesting and something that is worth <laughs> writing about. Second, each side of the political divide tends to think the other is shrewder. And I want you to listen to what this lady is saying here, more con conniving and more in control than it is. So they think that they're in control. <laughs> but listen to what she's saying. The reality is that both left and right are buffeted by events, and she's correct here, and political forces beyond their mask. So they're not going to make the decision as Biden perhaps thinks that he's making the, the decision because the political forces and perhaps events might determine that. And of course, could be another war could be something, whether it's war on the American soil or it's war abroad, anything, another pandemic, we don't know. But all of these things could interrupt what happens next year. But since the Democrats have a political establishment that has maintained more sway than its GOP counterparts, so they have to say all of this nonsense and play this political game. And the Democrats are more capable of coherent actions, right? Are they? Republicans attribute more power to Democratic string pullers than they should. Now, finally, there's always the psychological satisfaction of supposedly knowing that what's really going on beneath the surface, when usually the model of the surface, like being yoked to a flawed incumbent for the lack of realistic alternatives, is all that there is. So really, perhaps there is not much of a, uh, what you call it now, a competition, because you, how can you, if you have two candidates? Now, you'd have thought that 
the United States, if it really wanted to save its democracy, we had what we call January 6th. You should have allowed Joe Biden's candidacy to be contested because I don't think you should have these two guys running up. I'm not saying that if it's what the people desire, that that's what they should do, right? They should do it if the people desire that these two candidates, these former candidates, or these two former competitors, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, go up another time. But with the drama that happened on January 6, 2021, and you would not want a recurrence of such a, a, a riot, whatever it was, would you? You don't, you'd want to prevent that from happening a second time, perhaps by not having these two contenders. And I'm not saying again, if the people decided that they wanted to have these two contenders, but based on what we're hearing from the NBC poll, 76% of Americans are not happy with these presidential candidates. Not only it's left and right, it's not just the Democrats. They're also not happy with Trump being a political a presidential nominee. And that should be the whole quest of democracy. The people are not happy, so you select, you select others and allow the people to exercise their franchise and to see who they want. But that's not the case. We decide, the elites decide who you should vote for. And you are not in charge of anything. You do not run the show. And you've got to understand that. It would certainly be interesting if Joe Biden were about to be swapped out for Michelle Obama in a premeditated plan to wrongful Republicans and post to victory. In reality, Democrats, figuratively and literally, are stumbling ahead with the guy they've got, right? So they're stumbling with this Joe Biden. Right? And I'm not sure what compelling arguments they have to advance to the American populace as to why they are so insistent on having Joe Biden as the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. I am not sure. And if Americans are going to be convinced. But, you know, the media have an excellent way of selling the news, of marketing the news, marketing narratives. But I think that a huge swath of the American people will believe the story, the narrative, because it will be properly sold to them. And they will buy it. You know, it, it's sometimes very difficult to understand how we have sunk so low as a global population. Is it because we have these cell phones before us and people are constantly on laptops and phones and watching movies and they're not able to use the brain that God has given them to think? But certainly I think that I'm embarrassed sometimes when I look at what people do and the decisions that they make and the analysis that they often come up with. Embarrassed. And you think that, oh, being religious is something that is for the brainless people. And you don't understand how brainless our societies have become Western societies, that is, since we have decided to become less religious. We are literally brainless. And when I talk about the religion here, I'm not talking about a, a, a blind religion. I'm talking about an intelligent religion. We would rather have blind faith in our politicians, if the truth be told. And that is what it's all about. So somebody tells you that this person is upholding democracy, and you believe. You have no evidence to base your faith on. But you still believe. You still believe. 
that that person is going to be able to, to salvage the democracy in the country. Now, something is wrong. Something is wrong with our thinking. And I must say that the educational system functions really as the church right now, in which you go there and the God, they, they indoctrinate you into the gods of this world. Because our politicians are our new celebrities. And depending on, on how they market them, you vote for them. And you scream when you see them and behave stupid. Because they are so important. You have in Jamaica a situation in which they are called the most honorable. <laughs> the most honorable, even when they have no honor at all, but yet they are the most honorable. And these men and women walk around feeling proud to wield their power over you. And you do that every year and you cast your vote and you're, you sing and you dance and you're happy with the situation that they are. They are, you know, forcing us into. And the situation is not a pretty situation for any uh, demo uh, democracy in the world, at least well, whatever you call democracy, because sometimes I really wonder, what do we call democracy? And what is our working definition of democracy? I did tell you, however, on a previous video, that our working definition, for the most part, the citizens' working definition of democracy does not cohere with the politicians and, and I should say, the political economic elites' working definition of democracy. The two are at loggerheads. The two are in conflict with each other. And very soon, I think it's going to pose serious threat to our national security. United we stand, divided we fall. United we stand, divided we fall. Remember I told you that? Yes, it's unity that brings strength. Now, Charles Johnson, you know, had this to say in the chapter of his book, Sorrows of the Empire. And let me see if I can, you know, make this a bigger, the font bigger. Let me see what's here. Yeah, make the font here bigger so that I can yeah, remove this here. Yeah, okay. All I have to do is this. <laughs> Why am I making the job harder than it really is? <laughs> Okay, right. So this is Chalmers Johnson, and his book is entitled Sorrows, The Sorrows of Empire, Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic. Notice that Chalmers didn't say the end of democracy. He says the end of the republic. And I think we should do a little video on what is a democracy and what isn't. Because the founding fathers thought that they founded a republic, but we are touting now that it is a democracy. And democracy is really mob rule. Now, this is what Chalmers Johnson is saying, and this is on page 301. Yes, page 301. Listen to the philosopher and you know, esteemed scholar. As I have shown, the United States has been including, has been inching rather toward imperialism and the militarism for many years. So Chama Johnson of the United States has been inching, has been moving in that direction for many years, and people have not been following back. It's just not happening. And this guy died in 2010. The book was published perhaps in 2006 or further about. Okay, so this has been happening for decades. Our leaders, disguising the direction they were taking 
cloaked their foreign policies in euphemisms such as lone superpower, indispensable nation, reluctant sheriff, humanitarian intervention, and globalization. And you've heard these words so often. And now we hear it's democracy, freedom, and democracy, which probably be left out here. Right? The freedom and democracy. We are spreading freedom and democracy around the world. With the advent of the George W. Bush administration, and particularly after the assaults of September 11, 2001, however, these pretenses, so they were just mere pretenses, they were because they were not true, gave way to assertions of the second coming of the Roman Empire. And if you read Revelation 13, which I did give you a brief analysis, a brief lecture on Revelation 13, you will see that God spoke about the lamb-like beast and that it was a mirror to the former beast that it was before him. And all religious scholar by, scholars, by the way, understand that the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 is, the United, is undeniably is unequivocally the United States of America. All religious scholars, all well-thinking, I should say, religious scholars accept that understanding and that analysis. Same exact way. And many people have gone to Washington, D.C., and they have looked at what the structure and the way in which the, United, the Washington, D.C. is set up, and the same sort of mirror image of the Vatican, of the of, of, um, of Rome. God, in his brilliance, told us generations before, and we have not even believed it. To this day, we don't believe it. We're still holding on to what professor or that professor, this professor or that professor tells you, and what your politicians are telling you. But, and this guy was no religious guy. He was just looking at history, studying secular history and political science, and he understands that the United States is now the new Rome. And if you study the history of the Roman Empire, you will understand that the Roman Empire was an aggressive, was the iron power. It was the unbreakable power. But you still believe that you're living in a democracy and you're safe, and you have your freedoms, and you have freedom of speech. Ah, <laughs> if you understand what is happening on this platform on which I'm speaking, you'll understand that you are not living in a free society. You think you are, you imagine yourself to be, but you are not. And you've got to take stock, you've got to wake up, you've got to diligently do your own research. But many of you don't want to do your own research. You want to grab your phones and talk on the phones and talk nonsense with your friends and think that that is going to ease you. And one love, one heart, let's get together and be all right. Great, great. We should all try to get together and be all right. But if we're living lies, we cannot have one love, one heart. American imperialism used to be a fiction of the far left imagination, wrote the English journalist Madeleine Bunting. Now it is an uncomfortable fact of life. So he was saying here that before, when the American left, which really the America has a uh, tapered left, if you will. They don't really have left and right in, in, in the United States. What you have are two far two right wing. Uh, parties in the United States. One is right-wing. <laughs> I would say the Democrats are right-wing. And the, the Republican Party is ebbing toward the far left, to the far right. The Republican Party is ebbing to the far right. They are at the extreme right, while they, let's call the Democrats, a center right, if you will. Maybe not even at the center, too. They're still maybe at the right, where the Republican parties probably were in the 1990s, early 2000s. But the, Demo the Republican Party, for sure, is at the far right. During 2003, the Bush administration took the further step of 
carrying out its first preventive war against Iraq. A sovereign nation won 12 the size of the United States in population terms and virtually undefended in the face of the Pentagon's awesome array of weaponry and military power. Conducted with few allies and no legal justification, few allies and no legal justification, wanted to digest those words. And in the face of worldwide protest, talk about a country of laws, a country that says that it fosters, it encourages the rule of law. Well, this war brought to an end the system of international order that persisted throughout the Cold War and traced its roots back to the 17th century doctrines of sovereignty, non-intervention, and the illegitimacy of aggressive war. So this is where we are back. We have regressed. The United States from then, its democracy was in threat and might have been offended. You probably would argue that. You probably would decide that. From the moment we took on a role that included the permanent military domination of the world, we were on our own, feared, hated, corrupt, and corrupting, maintaining order through state terrorism and bribery and given to megalomaniac rhetoric and sophistries that virtually invited the rest of the world to unite against us. So from then, you talk about narcissism, Trump is narcissistic. The system and the people who are on top of that system are narcissistic. And you've got to understand that Trump is not the root cause of what is happening in America. He's just a symptom of the problem. He's just one of the many narcissists that sit on top of that powerful military industrial complex. We had mounted the Napoleonic um, tiger. The question was, would we and could we ever dismount? Doesn't seem like it's going to happen, right? Doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Let me just read this to you before I go, right? Because it's important that you understand because as the United States is touting, has started, I think, under George W. Bush, that the United States is the new Rome, is the new Roman Empire. And you've got to understand that. And you've got to now to delve in your, in your Bibles. You've got to do that research because the Bible is not simple as you think it is. Right? This is the word of God. And you think that you just go there and read it once and or twice or thrice. And you understand it, and you intellectualize it in human understanding of what intellectualism is all about. Roman imperial sorrows mounted up over hundreds of years. Ours are likely to arrive with the speed of FedEx, which means, therefore, that it's going to come down much rapidly, much more rapidly than how it, Rome was destroyed. If present trends continue, four sorrows, it seems to me, are certain to be visited on the United States. And this is Chalmers speaking. Their cumulative impact guarantees that the United States will cease to bear any resemblance to the country once outlined in our constitution. First, there will be a state of perpetual war, which we are now in leading to more terrorism against Americans wherever they may be and a growing reliance on weapons of mass destruction among smaller nations as they try to ward off the imperial juggernaut, which they are doing. Second, there will be a loss of democracy and constitutional rights as the presidency fully eclipses Congress and it's itself transformed from an executive branch of government into something more like a pentagonized presidency, which it is, really. 
Third, an already well shredded principle of truthfulness will increasingly be replaced by a system of propaganda as you are getting it in your news. Disinformation and glorification of war, power, and the military regions. And some people expend huge amount of energy talking about Israel and, and Palestinians and not knowing that there are other wars that they should also be talking about. And yes, rightly so, they should protest against that war. But do you protest about the same wars happening in, in Haiti? And in other countries where you probably think it's not worth your effort. You know, when you look at the whole war in Israel, which they should protest, and there should be a solid protest because of the number of people being slaughtered in these countries, right? So there should be a protest. So don't get me wrong here. I support that sort of protest. But I, we have to also look at the big picture. Haiti, for example, is right there at the back door of the United States. So when you see this, this the war that is about to happen there, or is, it continues to happen there, then you have to also take stock because that is where you are. And you know, it's home, really. Because the Caribbean is very, very near to the United States of America, to the shores of the United States of America. Now, Lastly, there will be bankruptcy as we pour our economic resources into ever more grandiose military projects and to shortchange the education, health, and safety of our fellow citizens. What pathetic analysis that this man gave. I told you when I read his introduction, and that happened around about 2019. I was going through the internet and I was looking for a book that speaks about the American Empire, which I have read all the books about the empire before, but when I read his introduction, the introduction to this book, Sorrows of Empire, I was flabbergasted and I knew that this man was not wasting his words. And that this was just not any other book that is written on the American Empire. Well written, well put together, and great documentation of the of the uh, the evidence. The future, of course, is yet is as yet unmade. All these trends can be resisted, and other better futures can certainly be imagined. Look at what he's saying here. But it is important to be as clear-eyed as possible about what the present choices and the present path of our imperial leaders portend. Have to be clear-eyed. And many of you are not clear-eyed when you talk to me on the phones. You're just not clear-eyed. You're not clear-eyed. You just don't understand the issues. You, you keep on nitpicking at what the dramas happening in Washington are about and what they represent. You don't understand deeply the issues that affect the nation. You're just saying Trump is racist and all of that nonsense. And perhaps Trump is racist, but you know, if you should look at other people also, perhaps at yourself, maybe you too are racist. Right? It's much more than Trump or Biden. I should say, we, we, we can talk about Biden, yes, and justifiably so, because yeah, how can a mentally unfit man run a powerful nation as that? The indispensable nation. So let me briefly assess the ramifications of each of these sorrows and try to estimate how far they have advanced. I would encourage you to read this chapter, right? Chapter 10, please read this chapter, right? Because he has and did expound up on the four tenets of the destruction of the empire, of how the empire would be destroyed, right? And among them, I think that was number two was or three, was the fact that the state would begin to dispense, disseminate, lots of disinformation and propaganda. 
and distortion of the facts and of what is truth. And we're seeing that every day. We are witnessing that every day. It's whatever the elites tell you that you should believe. And one of the things that bothers me, or bother me, I should say, is the fact that intelligent or people who think they're intelligent believe in the propaganda. People who, are, who, who teach the whole matter of propaganda, what it is, and critical thinking, have decided that they are going to throw all <clears throat> their critical thinking skills through the window. That is what concerns me. Very few of our people in this world, and if you have few critical thinkers, you don't have a democracy because how are you going to defend the virtues of democracy if you do not have people who are aware and who are alert to the powerful forces that might prevent democracy. It's not time for you to get your act together. And Americans, you, you need to also get your acts together. Because this election that is coming up, the coming, the upcoming election, doesn't seem to be heading in the right direction at this moment. You can only pray that God will you know, restore some amount of wisdom. At the end of the day, God is going to work out his purposes. At the end of the day, God's purposes will be worked out, but will they be worked out in favor of you and I? That is the question that I would like to ask ourselves. Because when you see, people think, when they say God, God is going to work things out for them nicely, and they're going to be happy and leading happy lives. But it doesn't work like that. Because a nation's sin, when it reaches a certain point, God will have to act. And the sad thing is, sometimes innocent people will suffer. We need to get our acts. We need to get our minds, more importantly, together. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you in our next video. Have a great Sunday.